It's your boy Danny here. I'm actually at my house today. This is probably going to be one of the last times I'm going to be doing any videos at my house with the exception of possibly doing something in my rod lab downstairs. Um, I am working on a fish cleaning and egg processing facility at the new location. So um, uh, I won't be doing it here anymore. Uh, so I wanted to just check in with everybody, kind of explain what's going on this year, explain um, uh, about the different types of eggs that I offer, um, the different textures and whatnot. Uh, so, so you know what you're getting and you could, uh, uh, you know what to expect and you know what to order. I have to do some updating at the, uh, on the website. Hey Rick, what's up partner? Um, so just to kind of give you guys different, uh, grades of eggs in general. Um, I've had some people get some scrape and you know, they think it's too soft, they can't tie it into bags, or the eggs are milking out too much. So I'm going to have to um, make a separate uh, addition on the website for softer eggs versus um, loose eggs versus hardened eggs. I don't typically sell many hardened eggs, considering every other shop in the world pretty much water hardens their eggs in tap water or whatever or they put them in a brine and they cook the shell and then the eggs don't work as well. And that's why everybody in the world thinks salmon eggs don't work as well as trout eggs is because most of the salmon eggs you buy are cured the same way and um, are just meant for something to put on the end of your hook. They're not meant to um, catch your fish necessarily. So, um, so yeah, uh, all of our eggs are all, you know, there's something I would personally fish and there isn't, you know, many other, um, many other producers, I bet that would fish their own actual eggs. So, uh, you know, this is a guide quality egg. I take unbelievable amounts of time. I lose tons of sleep just to make sure I can bring you guys superior bait than you could get anywhere else. So instead of screwing around on the, uh, on the tribs trying to get yourself eggs you can buy them from me um, and you know they're handled and treated right so you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time coming up and to the and dealing with the crowds and um, all that mess if sometimes guys like to go up there and deal with the the madness of um, you know all the different dams uh, or the salmon river to, to get their eggs and that's that's great if you if you're into that but if you want to stay home and fish your really good tributaries um, or the Erie Tribs, or, you know, you work a lot and you just don't have the time to get up there, you know, I'm able to supply you with something that you could be confident in and have an edge over other people. So, um, I just figured that we would have a conversation while I'm sitting here, um, packaging up, uh, you know, some eggs for the shop. Um, if you guys have any questions, you know, I could talk to you about the different eggs and kind of tell you what's going on. Everything I'll be packaging up today is um, uh, is just loose eggs. I did a bunch of um, scrape yesterday. They came out really, uh, really pretty good. And um, uh, so I'll show you guys some of that too that's already pre-packaged. So um, pretty much uh, I'm going to be scooping out containers. I got a couple different size containers. I'm actually going to do some half pound containers. Uh, which I typically only put the premium eggs. I have some lemon ice eggs that I have that I put in these small containers. And then I do the scrape in the smaller containers. Uh, so I just, I don't get enough, I don't get as much of that stuff and it's so much more work. So I figured I would, um, I would put them in the smaller containers so they would go further. So that is what I am working on now. But, uh. My mom, came, my mom called me. She knew I, I didn't sleep for five days. Or let me take that back. I slept for five hours over five days. I slept an hour a night. Luckily, the shop was incredibly busy, so I was constantly doing something. I tried to spool a reel for a couple minutes, um, and my mom had called, and I put put the phone to my ear and stopped reeling. And that time of me just standing there, I was falling asleep because I was so exhausted. Um, I had to drive to. Uh, to um, a city to get a bunch of uh, caviar and then I I went um, to the river and got a bunch of eggs 
uh, standard salmon eggs. So I'll kind of, uh, I'll see if I could show you kind of what I get and how and what I process too. So typically when I get the eggs, they come in uh, five gallon pails. And I'll get some like this is, this is a skein right here. And this is super clean. This is kind of how I want to get them when I do. What's going up, partner? What's going on, partner? Strickland. Oh, hey, bro. How you doing? Um, I got a phone call coming in. Okay. So, yeah, I'll typically get... These are the last of this year's skein. You can see how clean they are. I mean, they look really good. Almost no blood. You know, and then I'll get some that... Um, some at the bottom of the bucket that will have a lot more blood to them. You know, I got some in here. Once I get down in the bucket, it'll get worse and worse. But as you can see, I got this one here. And this one has even more, more blood. But it isn't bad. When I get down to the bucket where all the blood drains, that's where you'll really see it. So pretty much I have to take all these eggs and scrape these eggs one by one. So I don't put them in any water or anything like that. So you guys get a far superior egg to what all the other shops sell. So, um, so that is the skein. That's how that comes. And you can kind of see there's eggs falling off here. So there's a bunch of nice eggs here that fell off. So there tis the season to start scraping them. So those will, that's one project. And as far as loose eggs go, which I'm just starting to get now. You ever see that much eggs? <laughs> so anyways, these are the loose eggs and there'll be some skein mixed in here as you can see. But I pretty much have to go in here and there'll be livers and hearts and all kinds of stuff from when they cleaned them. And I'll pretty much go through here and pick out each one of those pieces and I'll roll the eggs and um, uh, I'll roll all the eggs in paper towels so they come out nice. So yeah, I mean that's pretty much kind of what's going on over here. paper towel so what's been going on Jeremy is that you PNW Strickland's um so the fishing on this end of the lake um just started picking up pretty good with the kings we got a really good push of fish coming through on the Ontario trips lots of salmon there's a good amount of steelhead mixed in and there is a pile of browns in there so the fishing right now is uh is really good um the browns are probably the best i've seen in you know 15 years there's just an absolute huge pile of fish we're dealing with this unbelievably low water in the erie tributaries where there's pretty much it's pushing all the guys into these really small rivers where you're only able to fish stuff with the flow because all the other rivers have had no flow and those poor fish in the holes are just getting ripped left and right and it's it's leaving uh it's not it's it's you know that's that's a quarter of the run that's run up there so those fish are going to be super pressured and they're only going to be biting really tiny things and you know jigs and nymphs and stuff like that um, our bigger rivers uh, have had that much more pressure, so low water across the board hurts everybody. Um, so it's it's been a struggle this year for um, it's been a struggle for us to be honest. Um, luckily, the shop's been busy. Guys are getting out. We're uh, we're selling a good amount of reels. Um, I have to be out of my old shop in a few days, so I'm uh, I'm getting ready mentally for that whole thing. Um, I sell the old building um, in the next few days, and then I'll be 
me and the rest of the guys, the few guys I have and can rely on, will be focused on doing the uh, the new shop. So I got a couple new guys starting this week, contractors that are going to hopefully speed up this process. And we'll be in there before you know it. And the place looks awesome. It, it's, it's really coming along cool. And like I said, I'll be able to have a fish cleaning station in there, a little fish cleaning room. And hopefully I'll be able to have live bait in there too. I'm trying to find, if any of you guys know of anyone who's got um, one of those sandwich uh, prep tables that have the refrigerator underneath it, um, I'm looking for one of those. Or I might just get a bunch of mini fridges um, and build kind of my own cleaning table. But I have this old bar sink that was in the new shop that uh, I, I hopefully can put on um, put on some pipes and convert them uh, um, and convert it to uh, to the fish cleaning table an egg processing table so if you know anyone that's got one of those sandwich prep tables or um, uh, one of the bigger long refrigerators that they're not using from a restaurant let me know um, so Rick those uh, I'll have to tell you a different way about about your question there because i can't really say it online here um but uh what's been going on what's been going on with you rick how's the fishing been in your neck of the woods and mr strickland if that's you how is the fishing uh, in the pacific northwest i um I heard that there was they were getting some better numbers of fish, so they thought the Olympic Peninsula would be open this year. I don't know if you could speak anything on that, PNW Strickland. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it sounds like they had a really great run of salmon in um, Oregon. A uh, buddy of mine who lives on the coast did really well there. Um, shout out to my man TJ. He's my friend I go stay with up in Oregon. Um, absolute awesome angler. Um, they let me stay at their house. Uh, his wife, Dev, is just amazing. They're great people. One of my favorite people to stay with. But, um, yeah, so that's been good. Um, there's been some really big fish in Erie, um, you know, getting caught out while, as kind of a bycatch while guys are walleye fishing. Um, they're just catching huge steelhead, you know, 12, 13 pounders. I had a guy in the other day, he told me he caught a 15.8 pound steelhead out of Erie during the summer and he weighed it on a scale. Um, so that means that fish potentially, you know, would have been close to 18 pounds if it would have ran in the fall. Um, you know, I saw also in Pennsylvania, poor Richards has been posting some absolute monster fish that guys are bringing in. So it's, uh, all signs point to when we get water that it should be good, but I can't tell you how often I've expected the fishing to be really good and that it's not been after a major blowout. You know, there's been so many times that the river's blown out and raging and I'm like, man, I can't wait for it to come down. And, you know, there, there is often other factors that will allow fish to run, but the first thing they need is the water. So you would think that would be the most important thing, but there's so much, um, uh, you know, re they're so reliant on temperatures, moon phases, all kinds of stuff. What up, Bennett? How you doing, brother? Um, so there's just, the, there's so many other reasons why they're running. We had warm water for so long into the season, into these tributaries. But I know it's like mass chaos on the Ontario tribs right now. Uh, you know, the problem is just the people and this low, this low water... Trying to find a spot where you could actually get in and fish has been difficult considering all the, not only are all the creeks super low and all the anglers are on a couple river systems, but all the fish are just in the fastest moving water or the deepest water and you don't have much chance in the deep water. The fast water where they, you know, need to make a decision a little quicker um, you can have luck there, but there's typically been guys in all the really good spots and these are steelhead. They bite, re you get the bait in the zone and they're going to bite pretty darn quick. So, uh, you know, it isn't rocket science. I went to the salmon river a couple days ago and fished with, um, my buddy, David, Ro uh, Roberts. Um, he goes by I'm burning on Instagram. If you don't follow him, he is an awesome angler, great human being in general. 
uh, another guy I really like to enjoy some time with when I go up to the Salmon River. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it was an absolute grind for me uh, when I went there. Like three of us fished. We only ended up each landing one good fish. Dave caught a smaller, you know, jack steelhead, but uh, his uncle Tommy ended up getting one nice mature brown. I got a nice six, seven pound steelhead. And, uh, you know, Dave caught a beautiful 11 pound um, chrome hen right out of the lake, clear fins. Absolutely beautiful fish. I mean, it was just, it's amazing. And, and the Salmon River is so unique because in all the holes you would typically think would be great steelhead water, there is, the fish just don't sit there. Like, they're just such in a run mode that they're more in transition water and smaller pockets. They're not like in your normal steelhead water you'd see in Erie Tribs. They really act the most like Pacific Northwest fish, um, specifically in Washington, our coastal Washington fish. Um, they're just in really unique areas. Like you go up to a hole that's like a perfect steelhead hole and you'll, you'll swear you're going to bang them out of it. And then you end up uh, you end up not catching anything, or you might catch you know a brown, or you might catch a chub, or you know if you're out west, you might catch a dolly varden, or um, or a bull trout, or something. Uh, you know, in those slower, more you know steelhead steelhead looking runs that you would think, um, but they they're really in pockety transition water, and oftentimes you got to look for um running lanes where they have to pass through a certain area and the, you know like they wouldn't take the shallow side they'd only take the deep side and it kind of funnels them in or if you have like a heavy gravel bank that covers a section of the river where the river just spills out and they have to run a gauntlet uh to get there um so it could be marginal water there but there'll be fish holding right behind it which is just it's incredible to me um, how different these fish act depending on where you are and um, the type of water it is and you know there's so many subspecies of steelhead that it's just so interesting to see how they all act different it's just it, re it, it really is cool it's one of the reasons why I love this so much and uh, um, I was actually last night while I was doing eggs I was listening to a, uh, a podcast on Spotify um from uh salmon trout steelhead and they were talking about uh the, the the guy's name is lucas and they were talking to scott ammerman i don't know if you guys know about the ammerman eggs and the ammerman cure but um scott makes all these eggs for the pacific northwest and i guess they're killer like he spends a lot of time on them and gets really good bait and there's uh only a couple places that sells them because he doesn't he doesn't have enough of them um, if you guys could excuse me for one second, I gotta find my little scooper and then I'll get right back with you here. Okay, no luck, so I'm, I am i don't want to keep you guys waiting, so I'm going to use one of my, my utensils from my house, which will work just as good. This is why I'm not married, because I wouldn't get away with this sort of stuff. Yeah, Roger, I was just talking about it. I, you know, we really need rain. We, we got to... Uh, we got to get some flow here going. It rained today, but I actually went to sleep today. Like I said, for the first time in five days, I was only sleeping an hour here and an hour there. It was really kicking my ass. But, um, you know, I got the rest today. I'm up. I watched some football. There were, the Bills weren't on today, but I watched a little bit of the Niners game. I watched the really ugly Jets-Giants game. And, um, yeah, just uh, excited for the Bills to play here uh, this week coming up. But, uh, okay, so anyways, I'll get back to what I was talking about. So, um, 
I think this would be better. I'll make some room and then I'll bring this up here so I'm not constantly bending down. You guys can see, look at those beauties. What's up, Steven? Hey, bud. Um, the shop's going good, man. Just plugging along and uh, we're, we're getting there. We're, um, we should be just a couple weeks uh, away from opening. And so, guys, I'll show you. As I'm scooping these out here, I'm going to find, like, little pieces of, like, popped eggs. Or I'm going to find, like, a piece of membrane in there. So, I'll pretty much, as I'm doing these, I hand pick all this stuff out. So, you have as clean of an egg as possible. I do miss them occasionally. So, if you get your eggs and you see a little dark spot, the eggs magnify the color. So, um, you'll end up getting, like... It looks like a cluster of dark eggs, but if you move it, sometimes it's just a leaf particle or it might even be a small speck of blood that I missed. But pretty much I hand pick out every single little piece I see. Um, I try to get the shells here and there, but I, I'm not as worried about those because those won't make the eggs go bad like the blood will. But um, yeah, back to talking about the podcast that I watched last night. Um, I watched one on... Um, I watched one on Scott Ammerman and Lucas from STS, and they were talking about they were going to close the Chinook season in Oregon, and uh, but they were supposed to, they were forecasted to get great runs, but they were going to close the season just to just to practice conservation. So it made no sense to close it for all the people that lived in Oregon. Um, there was no rhyme or reason to it, you know, they're, when they get their escapement numbers, which is the numbers of fish that are spawning and running, they don't do a great job. They don't spend a lot of time doing different stuff year to year, depending on the run. It was like, if they looked at escapement numbers for us this year with the low water, it would look horrible. If they talked to anglers, the, the fishing would be, you know, very doom and gloom. And if they're trying to make a decision whether to close the season or not, they would have bad information, even though the run really hasn't happened yet. So that's kind of what was going on in Oregon. And Scott Ammerman had noticed that the only time the, uh, what is it, the ODNFR, basically the Department of Natural Resources in Oregon, the only time they listen is if you file a lawsuit. So I don't know if Scott filed the lawsuit or he threatened to file a lawsuit. I think he threatened it at first and then ended up going through, but he filed this lawsuit. So they were able to fish for Chinooks and he won or he was able to force their hand so that they, that they would pull the idea of, um, pull the idea of not allowing people to fish for Chinooks. And what they're finding is, obviously, they had this great run this year, and thank God Scott stood up for all the fishermen, and all the fishermen followed suit, or I'm not sure what happened with that, but they definitely had the season open, and it's been a great run, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, it was a guy standing up for the fishery, which there just isn't enough guys doing that these days. Um, so I'm glad to see that somebody did. Typically these wild fish associations or these fly fishermen backed associations, um, they tend to do a lot better job getting what they want done because they take the time and energy to go out there and fight for what they want to achieve, where it seems like most of these other anglers are blue collar, they have to work a lot, they only get to fish every so often. It's hard for them to get the time to go out there and um, lobby and and picket or file lawsuits or whatever. Um, so you just don't see as many you know guys guys standing up for themselves um, and for their fishery that aren't like you know a, a, a wild fish a pro wild fish person that doesn't want any stocking. And I'm certainly pro wild fish, so there's nothing wrong with that. But I think. They need to stock as well because we really need um, we really need to supplement some of the catching. Um, and they, you know, the more they stock, the more fish there's going to be for the anglers, and that's a huge um, a huge business is fishing. And it's uh, it would be a real shame if they if they closed it for 
for a lot of small businesses like me and guides and charter boat captains. And the whole craziest thing is if they close the season in Oregon, um, Alaska is going to benefit and they're going to raise the amount of fish that they're allowed to keep. So if there's more fish in the ocean um, or there's, you know, the usual amount of fish in the ocean and they stop or they start allowing or they close the season in Oregon, Alaska will take more fish. So they'll say, OK, well, Oregon closed their season. So there's more fish to to be had when the fish, when the Oregon fish are in Alaska, living their life off the coast, feeding, um, maturing. And the Alaskan uh, sports fishermen will go out there or commercial fishermen and net a lot of the Oregon fish um, if the season is closed. So th it made no sense. You guys, uh, if you haven't checked that, um, if you haven't checked out that podcast, I listened to it on Spotify last night. It is like incredibly educational. Um, really enjoyed it. Wish it was a little longer. Um, but that, that was Scott Ammerman and Lucas from Salmon Trout Steelheader. I tried to find that one on YouTube. I couldn't find it on YouTube, so I had to go to, I had to download Spotify. Um, he also uh, had, a, had a podcast with, um, uh, with the new owner, I think his name is Jose of Lamaglass. Um, unfortunately, Tom Posey passed away, who was the owner of Lamaglass. And uh, it's under new ownership, but it sounds like they're doing lots of cool stuff over there. And they're um, making some domestic rods, uh, some different domestic rods, and um, some, cool, some cool things over there. Uh, it's pretty exciting. But, um, yeah, the, uh, Rick was saying here, there's more pink salmon showing up in Lake Erie. And, you know, this is an odd year this year. So the pinks typically run on an odd year. I see pink salmon almost every year out of Erie. There's a few Erie tributaries, I'm not going to really say where, but they get incredible runs of pink salmon, and they're not really pressured because just people don't know about them. And, you know, we'll get a lot of stray fish along the, um, along the New York tribs and the PA tribs, um, specifically in the western New York tributaries into Pennsylvania. I mean, the, the pink salmon, it's just been unbelievable. The guys fishing in the boats were catching them good. Um, there was guys fishing. Um, I, I, I really want to be careful about naming creeks here that aren't too popular. But um, there was a lot of guys fishing these smaller creeks and seeing, like, good numbers of pink salmon, you know, little pods of four or five of them, which is just incredible. Pink salmon would be just awesome if the DEC actually took the time to do some studies and and see the uh, how well those fish do. I mean, these are strays that we're seeing and just great runs of fish um, that are wild pink salmon from somewhere else, and we're seeing good runs. So if they actually took the uh, if they actually took the time and let's say stocked some pink salmon. That would open up our fishery so much. It would give the steelhead a break. It would provi provide the steelhead with lots of food in areas where um, there is good natural reproduction. There would be uh, there would be a lot of a lot of pink salmon flesh to feed the small um, wild trout, which is always a concern that you know steelhead and salmon will be competing for the wild trout that live in the rivers. And if you look in, in Michigan, I mean, their trout populations are absolutely incredible. And there's so much food in the tributaries that some of the browns, like getting a lake run brown in most of Michigan is pretty rare because the browns have such a good habitat and such a great food source in the Michigan rivers. They pretty much just live there and they grow, they grow uh, nice and big, but um there's some really nice inland browns, and they live there all summer, which gives you all kinds of fishing opportunities. Um, uh, I don't yet, Stephen, have a, a, an open house date yet, but I, I am, you know, hopefully we'll have a soft grand opening in maybe two or three weeks, depending on how much stuff gets done. And then I will do a, an event, probably maybe get a food truck there and a maybe have a barbecue or something for an open house day 
and uh, you know we'll see we'll see how that goes. But um, you know everybody's really excited for the shop, and I'm I'm excited to give you guys such an awesome place where you can call your home shop and you could come and check it out and enjoy. And um, you know you have a great opportunity to meet other anglers and uh, you know buy some great stuff and see some new gear and check out all the hard work I did on all the uh, all the different um, rock walls and wood walls and cork walls and there's just there's so much neat stuff in there that it's just it's worth coming to check it out whether you want to buy something or not it's it's a it's just a great it's a great gonna be a great place you guys are gonna be really proud to walk in there when you see it um, but uh, you know I'm like 90% done I still got to put on um the last finishing touches on some things the lounge will probably open at a later date because i just i'm just running out of time at this point a lot of the people that um were helping me either got busy with stuff or people that told me they were going to help me just never showed up so it's been it's been a, a real struggle to say the least um but uh right now we gotta uh we gotta start thinking about packing everything up and moving it and um, it's going to be quite the project, but it'll, like I said, it'll be all worth it when it's all finished. So, I'm um, really excited, uh, really excited for it. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much about it. I'm kind of running out of stuff to talk about here. So, hey Matt, what's going on, partner? I love Michigan. Thanks for the love from Michigan, brother. That's my uh, second home I consider Michigan. So, you know, it's it's amazing. 70% of my business comes from Michigan. So the support and love I have from there is just absolutely incredible. You you know, the it's it's hard to find people who are as as nice as the people in Michigan and Western New York. They really are you know, give give you the shirt off their back type of people. I mean, just amazing supportive just awesome so thank you guys for tuning in i'll be doing more podcasts coming pretty soon we're going to start one called the colville outfitters rodcast and it's going to be called the weekly hookup so um we're we're going to be running that you know once a week or every other week we have a whole room for a podcast so i won't be doing it in the kitchen anymore unfortunately but you guys get to see my home and uh appreciate appreciate everything jeremy asks what size beads do you like for Lake Erie? And um, I'm going to give you a pretty standard answer. When the conditions are perfect and it's got, you know, let's say 18 inches of visibility um, or let's say a foot of visibility, I'll typically fish a 12 millimeter soft bead. And, um, and then if, you know, we got conditions that are clearing progressively, and, you know, it's like one of the more shale-based tributaries. I'll fish more tens. Um, right now, I'm fishing sixes and eights on these, on these creeks because the water is just so, so darn low. So not only is it the smaller profile bait that's going to help you catch more fish, but it's also how natural the bait drifts. So obviously, the lighter you go, the more bites you're going to have, right? And that, that's all the way from your line to your leader to your float to your hook everything the smaller you go the less stuff you have on your line the more natural it's going to drift so you got to remember the weight of what a bead does and what the hook does to the bead so the the bigger you go the bigger hook you got to use the heavier your hook and your bead is so the faster it's dropping and the less natural it's looking if you have flow we're able to kind of manipulate during that drift what that bead is doing. Um, it will act natural because you're kind of, you know, pulling your rod and angling your float to give you the presentation that you're desiring and that's going to work. Um, what's going on, Buck Deer? How you doing, brother? Um, so, so yeah, but like right now, if I was going to go brown trout fishing in Ontario or if I was going to, fish an Erie trip, I'd pretty much start with a six or an eight bead, you know, that's, that would be kind of my ticket. And I'll tell you, you know, especially if I'm fishing for browns up in Erie, the, the sixes and eights really just work awesome. 
and if you are fishing for browns it's really tough to beat running brown trout eggs you know you guys know i preach you know salmon eggs salmon eggs you know that's that's my favorite all-around bait but if you're actually fishing for browns itself it's tough to beat a, um it's really tough to beat brown eggs like they really hone in on their own eggs like incredibly so but uh, I'm going to send it off here, guys, and love you all. Appreciate all the support. I mean, I, I, I can't express how grateful I am that uh, you guys allow me to, um, to do this and follow my dreams and my heart and bring you guys this amazing shop. And I really feel like I'm doing what I should be doing in life. And um, I'm going to keep working hard and, uh, you know, and fishing when I can. And, um I really hope I can bump into you guys on the river and share a drift with you. If I don't see you there, hopefully I'll see you in the shop. And if you've kind of been wondering where I am the past year when you've come in the shop, I've been at the other shop working. So I promise you, you'll see me a lot more when I, uh, when I uh, open this new store because that's where I'll be. But love you all, tight lines.